Some of the one-dimensional types that we are going to uh, discuss today include a character, which is basically either a longer strings or individual characters such as a uh, letter A, uh, which you might have seen so far. Uh, they are a quoted uh, va values. Another ones are numeric. So basically this is uh, any real number you can encounter or work with. Uh, a kind of a special case of a numeric class is a class uh, named integer. It is like any integer or so-called any whole number. Uh, what else we are going to discuss today includes factors, which are going to be a categorical or quality variables, a logical class, which are variables composed of uh, two values, a true and a false, and a date or so-called POSIX CT, which is a class that represents either a calendar dates or in case of POSIX CT, a date and a times. And I think especially this last part we are going to cover in this module is going to be very useful for you because it is going to show you how to handle a dates or dates and times that you may encounter in the data sets you are working with and how to um, use, how to leverage existing functionality in R that allows you to operate uh, with these dates and dates and types. So let's move on. Character and numeric. Uh, we have already covered, or at least we have already seen some of the examples of a character and numeric class types. So when it comes to the character one, again, these are the values which are in the quotes. And here we are having a vector of length two, which is a vector containing two elements of a class uh, character. So you can see that when I am running, when I am using a function class on this vector, it is going to return me an information about the class that those elements are of, in this ca case, character. Similarly, for um, irregular numbers, when I'm using the function class on this vector, I'm going to learn that those elements are coming from a, uh, coming from a numeric class. Uh, a new thing we want to discuss is an integer. Integer is a, is a subset uh, of the class numeric that contains only the whole numbers. And a way of generating um, a values or a vector that is of a class integer would be to use function seek. Seek is a function itself that takes, for example, an arguments which are specifying the first and the last element of the sequence you would like to generate, you would like to generate. Uh, the seek can be used to generate um, more customized sequences as we are going to see later by but by default it is going to generate a vector of numbers which are separated by one value so we can see that we are having one two up to five we have specified here and the class of a vector generated that way would be an integer another a sub another subclass or another special case of the class named numeric that you may see in other resources is a double Double is representing any uh, any real number. So um, an integer is a subset of num numeric. Uh, integer, sorry, integer is a subset of numeric. Double is a subset of numeric, and numeric is like a general class of uh, of numbers uh, we have in R. Moving forward, there is a class uh, named logical, and this is a specific class that has only two possible elements. It is true and this is false. And um, to define or to use the elements of this class, we are typing true and false, and we are not using a quotation mark to specify those things. So here I'm creating a vector containing five elements of the class logical. Once again, you can see that in particular, they're not surrounded by a quotes, even though they're like letters itself. And you can see that when I use the function class on this vector, it is returning me the information that this is a logical class of the elements. And once again, if I were to type a similar thing, but the true and false expression would be surrounded by quotes, such vector would be considered of a character class. Um, I think it is important to mention that the logical type is something we may often use later to get the information whether our data is or is not something. So for example, so far we've been implicitly 
using or getting the logical uh, type value when we were running an if else function. So you may recall that the if else function has three elements and the first element is testing something, some expression that is testing some condition. And under the hood, what is happening, this first part of the if else function is actually returning either true or false element of a class logical. So just a tiny technical detail to have on the back of your head. Um, there is two functions that can be particularly useful uh, to learn uh, to work with uh, the notion of a class of the element. The first one uh, we want to cover is the function. It's actually a set of functions which are having a similar syntax in a way that they are starting with the word is, then they are having a dot, and then they are having a name of the class we want to test for. An example is given here. I am having a function which is named is numeric, and I want to use it to learn whether or not what I am having inside, and in this case, it is a vector of a class character, as you can tell from me using a quotation mark of its elements, whether or not this vector is of a class numeric. And since it is clearly not numeric, it is a character, the information I am getting as a result of running this function would be false. So specifically, the information, the result of running this function, it is going to be of class logical. It is either true or false. And similarly, I can use uh, yet another variation of this function, uh, which is testing whether or not something is a character. So again, I'm having this first part is, and then the name of the class I want to test for. And inside, I'm having, in this case, indeed a vector of a class character. So the result of running this function is going to be true. Um, okay, it seems like it is a little bit of a duplicate, uh, duplicate uh, of, a, of a slide. Um, we are going to use it to uh, cover yet another example. In this example, I'm testing whether or not this element is of, of a class character. It is not a character because what I put here is a vector of numbers. And below, I'm having another example which is going to return me true because indeed the vector I am testing for is a vector containing of uh, elements of a class numeric. And um, in the next slide, we are going to uh, work out the second function out of the two useful functions to work with the notion of the class. It is named S followed by a dot and a class name. So this function is used to coerce or cast the element X can be a vector or can be like a, a single element from its current class, the class that X is of, into the class I am specifying I want to coerce into. And to better understand that, let's take a look on some other example. On, let's take a look at a few examples. Uh, these three examples are showing the case where this coercing with the use of S, dot, and the name of the class is actually doable, meaning it's going to fly without any problems. The first example is taking a vector of numbers, and I'm specifying that I want to force this vector, I want to cast it to be a character instead of numeric. And you can actually see that it worked without any problems. Basically, the result of running this particular function, it is going to be a vector of the same length as here, where each element was cast from a numeric into a character. Uh, similarly, I can take a vector containing strings where each string is like typed number. However, you can see that those numbers are surrounded by quotes. So as of here, they're still considering, considered to be of a character uh, class. Yet after I use the function as that numeric on this vector, the result of that are going to be numbers itself. And the last example where this coercing where, where, this, where using this coercing, coercing function is going to uh, fly without any problems, is taking a vector of uh, characters where each character is either true or false. And what I'm asking for is to coerce that into a logical uh, class vector, which also goes without any problems. So you can kind of tell that this element are the logicals because here you no longer see the quotation marks that were present when we were specifying the character. So um, this functions, can be used to, again, change the class of the values you are having. 
let's now take a look at the example where using those functions does not actually work as smoothly. The first case is using the vector of characters where each element is, where the first two elements are basically the numbers. However, the third element is having a number and some letter next to that. So when I am now trying to coerce this vector into the values that are in numbers, it is going to return me a vector of one, four, and an A. So one, four, and four are the values that without any error were able to be converted into the numeric. However, we can't really convert into the numeric this expression. R is not going to be guessing that indeed you meant to only, for example, take this value because it is taking what you have provided that. And uh, in this specific case, when we are trying to, in case, when we are trying to convert into a class some expression that is not really convertible, we are going to have NA return. So NA, we have already seen that. It stands for uh, not available or um, missing value. It is this specific R constant that you will see in your data, meaning that basically the data is not present here. And when I was running this uh, function, I also seen a warning displayed into the uh, console that NA, NAs, in this case, one NA, was introduced when we were coercing the values. Um, for example, a practical uh, note to keep, keep in mind from this part is that when you are working with a data frame, you might be interested in doing some operations on the numbers you are having. In case the numbers you are having were originally given to you in the form of uh, characters, as here, you may want to take the whole column of the data and coerce it into the number. However, if you are doing this operation and you see that there's some warning like that displayed to you, that might be information to you that in one of the fields, let me take a quick break and just close the window. Sorry, I'm having some construction behind the, uh, behind my building, which was generating a noise. So if you are trying to, for example, convert the whole column of your data into a numeric from a character and you are seeing this warning, that may be a hint to you to take a better look at the values you are having to, for example, spot for such a situations that maybe somebody that was manually inserting uh, the data uh, to the file they sent to you made a typo or any other error. So something to, something to be aware of. A similar example here, we are trying to coerce the uh, vector containing characters that are true, false, and also unknown. And as we mentioned, the logical class is only taking two values, true or false. Therefore, this unknown is going to also be uh, converted into an ace. And last but not least, a date. We haven't discussed that it's going to uh, show up in a couple of next slides, but date is yet another class that we have in R. And in this case, I am trying to take a character, vector of two characters, and convert it into the class date. In case of the first element, it is going to uh, conclude, it is going to uh, execute without any problems. The displayed version of the class of a date is basically a date um, in a quotation mark. So it kind of appears not different to what we're having right here. We'll later see that there is a difference between a date class and a character class, just showing the date values um, that is happening under the hood. However, what is happening here when I'm taking this particular value, and you can see that this is specifying a date which is in a some year, in some month, but it is specifying a day which is not existing in any of the month, I'm going to end up with an S itself. So again, something to be cautious, coercing data is an operation that you will likely run into when doing your analysis, but these problems with converting one class into the another is a thing to check for whether or not it is happening as you are doing your operation. Factors. So factor is a, um, a way, um, or factor is a, a special kind of a character vector where the elements have a predefined groups or levels. And I think it might be a little bit more um, uh, clear to think about them as basically a type of a class that we often use in R to represent qualitative or categorical variables. And here we have just one example of that, 
we are having a vector that is having three different values. It is red, red, blue, yellow, blue. Um, when I am uh, assigning those vector to the variable name x and I am checking the class of this uh, vector, I'm seeing that this is in the character ex as expected. And now I'm running a function um, that is converting me character into a new class named factor. So I'm basically running a function named factor on this x, and I'm assigning the result of running this function into the new variable named x underscore fact. And the class of this newly created variable is indeed a factor. And now let's learn what the factors are. There's a couple of things to unpack about that. I am first going to um, discuss uh, the things we can do with the factor, and then I'm going to provide a little bit technical note of why we may want to use factors instead of just staying with this, uh, just a character information when we are doing data analysis or processing the data. Um, so before the technical note, uh, when I'm just typing out this variable, when I'm just printing that, you can see that the result I'm getting is first of all, the vector is getting printed. So I have here five elements as I had in my initial character vector, but they are no longer in a quotation mark. And the second thing that is always, that is getting displayed when I am printing out this variable is this new thing named levels. Uh, this levels um, roughly can be think about the list of unique values I'm having within my uh, vector. So in this case, this unique values, there are three unique values. It is blue, red, and yellow. And levels are going to be displayed to you by default in alphanumeric or order. There are ways to alter that, which you can need either for the purpose of visualization or, yes, visualization uh, or um, some other uh, summaries you may, you may want to produce and have the results printed in a specific order uh, where the order of the levels can be like guiding how the, the order of things, uh, some of the summaries you may produce uh, may be displayed in. Um, you can, uh, without displaying the, the whole variable, you can learn what are the levels of this uh, variable of, of a class uh, factor by typing the function levels. So what you can see here is a vector of a class character that is basically printing out the values uh, of the levels I have within this factor. So you may actually think about that as something similar to what we have done when we were using the unique function on the vector of a uh, class character to learn what are the unique values within our variable. And um, yes, the information that there is a function or a level that you may use if any time in the future you would need to uh, learn uh, how to alternate the default alpha numeric level of the levels, uh, alphanumeric order of the levels. Um, Factors can be converted to numeric and character very easily. So again, here I'm just printing out the variable factor I have. And again, I see all the five values within them as well as the levels being listed. When I coerce that into the character, I'm going to go back to my initial point where the five values are basically a character. And when I coerce it to numeric, I am going to have the numbers corresponding to the order of the levels of this factor. What is happening here? Let's un unpack it slowly. So let's go back to what this vector is containing. It is containing this five values. The first one is red. And when I take a look at the levels, I can see that red is listed as a second out of the three levels this factor has. So when I am coercing this five, factor values into the numeric, the first number is going to be corresponding to what is the level number of the first element. And again, the first element is red. It is the second level out of the three levels. So I'm going to see here too. The same with the second element of the factor. It is also red. So the two is going to show up here as well. What about the third element? The third element is blue. And blue is the first out of the three levels I'm having in this vector. So when I'm coercing the factor into the numeric, 
the behavior of this uh, coercing is that I'm going to see the number one because the level corresponding to blue was one out of three. And lastly, for the yellow, I would see the number three because the level corresponding to this value is the third one out of the three listed here. Now let me quickly see if there's another slide. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the point that I would like to make a technical uh, note why we may be interested in using factors and converting our character uh, vector into the factors rather than just sticking with the character that we have when we are reading the data in. The reason is that what is happening under the hood is that those character values are being kept as a numbers itself. So basically, you can think that when you are having a data frame and you convert its character column into the factor, what R is going to be storing is rather than this character expression, it is going to be storing a number. And in this case, this three element map, which is saying blue is one, red is the second, and yellow is the third. It can be particularly useful if, it's if it turns out that your data are some longer strings. Then converting those longer strings into uh, numbers and just keeping this like short map, which is mapping the particular number to the character it represents, is working towards the speed and the memory under the hood. So for example, doing operations like sorting or matching that we will be covering later on when you are using a factor is going to be faster. Or when you are just storing the data in your memory and the column was converted from character to the factor, since once again, it is not under the hood preserving the character, but rather numbers. And just this like short table of the mapping between the numbers and the character it represents, it is going to be taking less memory. So the factors uh, is a way to storing a characters, which has some benefits that are happening under the hood. And you are likely going to run into the factors that are being used when you um, see the examples of data modeling or data aggregating. This is the reason that we I wanted to make sure that you are familiar with this class. Uh, is there a way, let me just read out the chat, is there a way of or function to see which numeric lines up with which factor level? Uh, yes, I would say that one way is to do this operation. And the other way, the other way is to basically uh, list the levels you are having of your factor. So when I list the levels, that's going to be the number one, that's going to be the number two, that's going to be the number three. When it comes to the numbers, this vector is um, mapping the numbers into, into the character. Oh, I see what you're saying. I, I guess not necessarily um, like a ready to go function, uh, but a way to go would be to construct such a map yourself meaning you are taking one vector, which is this one, like levels, and you are taking the, the other vector, which is just iteration one, two, three, and you are keeping those two vectors somewhere handy. This is something we can definitely discuss on Slack later on. Um, let me take a sip of water. Yet another practical note is that different functions, which you can use to read in the data from the file into the R, are going to have different default behavior, how they are handling, how they are um, determining the type of the column when they are seeing a strings, a character in your data file. So we discussed so far primarily two functions, uh, two types of the functions, two family of functions to read the data from the file into the R. One of them was coming from a base R, and you can recall that the syntax for these functions was read and then a dot, and then, for example, CV, CSV, if the CSV is the kind of a file you want to read. And when you are using this function, which again comes from a base R, the default behavior would be that any strings, any um, columns which are having strings, are going to be automatically converted into the factor. However, when it comes to the tools from the read R package that we discussed, uh, which you can recognize by the syntax that there's a read, and there's the underscore, and there's a CSV, the default behavior here 
is going to be keeping the character as it was read in. So if you want to have a factor from a column that contains only strings, you would have to manually convert that to the factor first. Uh, I think it is important difference to be aware of um, because you may find yourself like once reading the data with this, the second time reading the data with this, and be a little bit surprised that your columns are being determined to be in one case a factor and in other character. So something to be aware of. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have um, two short functions that we want to introduce to you that can help you um, generate uh, vectors containing either this qualitative or numeric variables that can be useful in many uh, situations. Um, and we'll see that on a lab in, during the lab. So the first function is rep. It stands, it is an abbreviation for repeat or repetitions. Um, a two examples in which we you can use it is to uh, generate a vector of values that is made out of some short vector you are providing. In this case, I am providing a vector of a length two, which contains a character black and car character white. And I am asking to generate me a vector in which each of this element is going to be repeated is going to be repeated three times. So the result of running this function is listed here at the here below. You can see that first I'm having three times repeated the word black, and then I'm having three times repeated the word white. Uh, so the, the result of running this would have six elements because I have like two elements in my initial like a base argument of what I want to be repeating. And I specified that I want each element to be uh, repeated three times. A small alternation of uh, using this reap function would be to specify that instead of each time, three times, sorry, instead of repeating each element three times first and then another element uh, three times, I want to take this whole vector and concatenate the whole vector next to each other three times. So you can see black and white, one repetition, black and white, another repetition, black and white, yet another repetition. Some practical cases where I find this rep function particularly useful is, for example, when I am, say, reading a data, and this is a data describing, say, a set of 10 individuals, and for each of the 10 individuals, I have three observations. For example, there, I don't know, some property of them collected over three different years. So basically three rows, one individual. And I want to create a new column, which is, for example, an identifier for this person. Then I would use something in the lines of this function to generate me a new column where each, let's say, number or each like name of this person is repeated three times. So as it corresponds to the three observations I have for that person, et cetera, et cetera. OK, let's move to the last slide before we jump to the lab. Another useful function uh, to create a vectors of a type numeric is a seek. We have see seen a seek at the very beginning of the slides. Here we are presenting a two examples of using the seek function. So seek function is generating a sequence of numbers, uh, depending uh, the sequence of uh, numbers, um, given the properties of a sequence you are providing. So here I am specifying the sequence of numbers I want to get with the use of three arguments. The first argument is specifying what is the starting point of the sequence I want to produce. The second value is specifying the end of the sequence I want to produce. And this is, uh, the, um, um, this is the step between each element I want to have. And you can see that the result of running the seek is the vector presented here. It indeed starts at value zero I specified. It ends at value one I specified. And each of the values is separated by 0 0.2 I specified as my by argument. Yet another version of using that would be to, instead of specifying what is the by, like what is the uh, value of the difference between each of them, uh, to specify what I want to be final length of the outcome to be. So here I'm only giving, I am only giving what is the first value, the starting point of my sequence, what is the last value of my sequence, and how many numbers I want to have at the end. And R is automatically determining what has to be the split between the subsequent values. They're going to be equally um, separated. So as 
the outcome has 10 elements. So um, this is like yet another way of um, generating a vector of values, which is having some uh, nice, uh, the properties. I, uh, when it comes to the practical use of that, I would say that from my personal experience, I very often use the seek function, for example, when doing any simulations. And I want to quickly get a set of numbers, which is fulfilling uh, the range between something and something, and either has a certain length as here, or is basically a separate by some specific value I have in mind. Uh, so now we are having the first out of the three labs. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing. I'm going to actually first copy paste that to the chat so you can have it handy. Okay, so now we are going to jump into dates and um, other classes which are used to keep not only calendar date, but also like hours, minutes, etc. Um, the big picture is that there are two most popular R classes that we may want to use when working with dates and dates and times. The first one is the class named date. It is a class named date with the um, first letter representing the name of the class with the uh, uppercase. And this is a class representing a calendar date, like year and month and a day. And then there is a class um, named POSIX CT, which is representing an object which, is consist which consists of a date, but also information about hours, minutes, and seconds. So this is something you may have in your data when you are recording, say, some activities of individuals in your study, which are happening a multiple times of a day, and you want to have a pointer to the exact time that this activity happened. So not only a calendar date, but also like more high resolution time information. And most typically, when you are getting a data set from a collaborator, you would have this data information inserted or considered as a character, meaning it would be provided in a quotation or basically a string that somebody typed or it was generated in some other way. And once you read the data into R, you may be interested in converting this originally a character column into a class being either a date or this POSIX CT in order to be able to leverage, to use a set of functionality that was um, that is available to work with this, uh, with dates and times, et cetera. And we are going to uh, show you some examples of what are the uh, capacities of that. The examples are going to be relying on a library date package. This is a powerful, very widely used R package that, that comes from this tidy diverse family of well-established, well-tested, well-documented packages, which is specifically dedicated to work with the um, vectors of a class date or POSIX CT. And throughout the examples, we're going to be mostly using uh, this package. So first, let's take a look how we are creating a date class object. I'm going to be start, I'm going to start with just considering a character uh, in which we are having a year and a dash and a month and a dash and a day, day value. So when I am running a function class on this expression, to start with, I'm going to see that this is just a character. It is not a date yet. And here below, I am uh, going to, to start with demonstrate a way that in base R, we could convert this character element into the date character. So I'm going to use this uh, function S and a class name, a coercing function that we introduced at the beginning. Um, and the outcome of this function is of a class date. It actually looks exactly the same, like by visual inspection, as a character, meaning it is just a string expression surrounded by a quotation mark. However, if in addition, I'm going to check with the use of a class function, what is the class of this expression after coercing into the date, I'm going to see the difference between this part and this part, meaning that this is already of a date class. And uh, this slide is presenting a similar thing, how to convert a character into a date, but with the use of the library date package. So I'm going to load the package, and I'm going to use the function ymd on this string, on this character, to get 
a date class object. And similarly, as on the slide before, when we were using the base R, you can see that the result of running this function is looking by visual uh, inspection pretty much alike as just a regular character, meaning it is the expression surrounded by a quotation mark. However, again, when I use the class function to inspect what is the class of the thing I'm having inside, you can see that this is again the class of a name date this time. I want to draw your attention to how this function is uh, named. Uh, the syntax of the functions from a package library date uh, is going to be uh, alike across a number of functions we're going to show in the slides. And you can see that um, uh, it is representing an underlying construction of the date provided in a character we have, meaning the first part corresponds to the year, uh, which first letter is Y, that's why we're having Y here. The second part is corresponding to the month, and the M is the second letter of the name of the function, and at the end we are having the day. So this YMD is uh, um, a naming of the function from a package library date, which is suggesting what kind of a construction of the character this function is expecting. And let me very quickly investigate the chat. Sorry. Um, oh, we have an excellent question. Does the original character have to be in a certain format to coerce it into a date? Um, you, as, you can, uh, as you can expect, there is going to be a whole variety of different ways a, data, um, a date can be specified in the data you can receive. And I think it is actually a next slide when we're going to uh, learn that. Yes, so um, there's two different, there are two another examples that a date is provided in a form of a character that you are getting. So let's take a look at the first one. The first one is first having a month, then it is having a dash, then it is having a number of a day, and then it is having a number of a year. And to parse this character into a into an object of a class date, we are also using a function from the library date um, package. But instead of YMD, we are using function named MDY. And a short explanation is provided here that, again, the naming of this function is indicating the ordering of um, the elements of the date uh, the, function is ex the function expects to see. So in this case, we first have month, then we have day, and then we have year. And you can see that this is corresponding to the naming of this function. Uh, the second line is to show you that the library date package is designed to handle, uh, to flexibly handle or be able to decipher how the uh, underlying, what the underlying date represents. So now, instead of having the full year number, I'm only having the like the last first, sorry, the last two digits. And even though it is not looking alike as the first example, I'm getting exactly the same result because of the underlying heur heuristic, which is used in this function um, to help us handle this data. Um, let me see quickly the chat. Okay, see it's being handled, thank you so much. Um, let's move forward. Now we are going to move towards creating the objects of Paul 6 CT class. So again, a typical scenario that may happen is that you are going to get your data set, which contains some high resolution date and time information. And you want to take this information that would be initially originally read as a character in your data to convert it into an object that you can later manipulate flexibly in R. And um, here we are presenting a ways of doing that with, again, library date package. In the very first line, I am showing you that I am working with a string, a character expression. And I can indeed confirm that by running a class function on this part, which is clearly showing me that as of now, this part is just a character. It is not representing a date and time yet. And now I'm going to use the function from, again, library date package, which is named ymd underscore hms. And this function is generating me the object of a type POSIX CT from this character string. 
When I am printing to the console the result of running this function, you can see that it indeed does look pretty alike as its character, um, as its character uh, origin that we converted it from. But it has this additional part here. It is UTS. So UTS represents a time zone. By default, it is representing um, coordinated universal time. Uh, a time zone is a part of the information we have attached to the uh, variable of a class date. Uh, sorry, variable of a class POSIX CT. Um, it is uh, outside of the scope is, of this class of consider all the like a kind of a corner cases when it comes to using the uh, time zones. It is something you may definitely get interested and in, search, for example, resources related to library date package, which are dealing with time zone. For example, when you are working with the data of individuals that were collected from individuals from a different time zones, for example, across US or across. Uh, oh, I had a comment from a carry that um, tidyverse is unusual in this way. Um, oh, I think it is uh, referring to one of the previous questions. Sorry. So, in case you are having in your data uh, dates and times which are from individuals that were living in a different time zones when the data were collected, you may want to be careful with working with uh, this data. The reason is that some uh, software or hardware that was used to generate the data, so say individuals were, um, uh, were say, um, using some device to record activity they are doing throughout the day. And the device is returning you a date and time of this activity that was performed. Um, this device might have had encoded the time zone information that you may want to handle in some special way that depending on how it was uh, recorded. So this is, this is more a technical topic. We're not covering that, but definitely wanted to point you to that so as you are aware. But moving forward, uh, the third line is showing us that the class of this expression is indeed a POSIX CT. And there's uh, also listed some other class that is uh, very related to this one. But the point was to understand that after running this particular function, we are converting our character into the this class object. And again, you may note that the function we use to create an object of a class POSIX CT uh, that comes from a library date package is constructed in this um, way that is suggesting what kind of a character input structure it is expecting. So first, we want to have year, month, and a day, as we did provide. And then the function will be searching for information about hour, minute, and a second, which is in the, the ordering we're having here. It, is, it might be possible that the data you're working with is, for example, only going to have this information, which means it was recording the time on the resolution of a minute, not of a second. So basically, your data would not have this part. Then there is yet another function from the library date package, which is just missing this last S standing for a second that you would use to convert a character into the POSIX CT. And similarly, if you only had literally this part of the string in your data, and this 19th would stand for an hour, you could use this function to convert your object of a class character into an object of class POSIX CT. And now we're going to um, jump into some more, perhaps more interesting part, which is why we are using that. So we bothered to convert the character to either date or this POSIX CT as we'll see on the next slide, to be able to use some additional functionality that those that the package library date comes with. So I'm going to start with by creating a vector of two elements of a class date. And I'm doing that by just plugging a character of the two dates and running the function ymd on this vector, which basically results me a vector of two elements where each of these elements are of the type uh, date. And here we are having just a few examples of a whole set of different functionalities that you may want to do. So let's start with this one. I'm using a function day um, on this vector. And this function is returning me a particular day 
that those two dates are corresponding to. And this day is basically an a like index of a day from a month. So here we are having uh, June 15th, here we are having July 15th. So the result of running a day function, both of these days is going to be 15. Uh, then we are having another an, an example of operation. I'm taking my vector x and I want to generate a date which are x 10 days later. And since I am applying this operation to the vector, both elements, both two elements of this vector are going to be uh, transformed in this intended way. So I'm using another function from the package library date, which is named days. And this package, uh, sorry, this function adds, is creating me a new dates, which is a result of adding this number of days, in this case 10, to the dates I had originally. So you can see that indeed, this is a date that was constructed from adding to this one 10 days. And similarly, this one is constructed from adding 10 days from this. A combinations of that are available. So for example, I'm taking X and I'm adding one month and then 10 days. And you can see that instead of June 15th, I'm having July 25th here and a correspondingly processed data here. Uh, just an, uh, yet another example, I may be interested in taking the day, uh, taking the days I'm having and learning what is the weekday that those dates are corresponding to. And to do that, I may use the function weekday and apply that to uh, the vector of values I have x. And in this particular case, I'm also specifying that I want the uh, result to be uh, generated, to be displayed, to be shown with the, uh, the labels set to true. So this part actually touches what we have discussed earlier. It touches the factor structure Precisely what is happening here is the casting of the values of a class date into the values of a class factor. So the result of running that would be a factor. I can see the first two values of this factor because I only had the two values in my original vector. And it is something we haven't really discussed, but we, are, we have created an ordered factor, which means that the levels of this factor are having a specified order, which is different than the default alphanumeric, um, sorry, they're not only sorted in a certain way, but they're also having a hierarchy between them, which is specified by this directional arrows. Um, you can see that the levels which are listed here are the all seven weekdays we have in a week whereas the values we had in our um, vector were only those two ones. Um, yeah, I acknowledge it is a little bit more technical remark. I, I guess I primarily wanted to draw your attention that within the set of useful functions you may uh, want to access when working with dates, there is one of them which uh, gives you an information what is the week of the day corresponding to your date. And possibly even more, um, more interesting is uh, set of functions you may want to use when it comes to ma manipulating with uh, post x ct object, which once again is both uh, is a calendar date and the time information combined. So I'm starting here by creating a vector of a class post x ct, which contains only one element. It is this particular date and this particular time. You can see again that I have this um, time zone information displayed when I am um, displaying, when I'm printing the x to the, uh, to the console. And here I'm having an examples of three different things uh, I'm doing with that. The first thing you may be interested in is just casting the, um, is just pulling the information about the date from this whole expression. So maybe you are not interested in working with the time information, but you were given that in your data set and you want to uh, coerce that into the date only. This would be the way to do that. Another example is that, let's say that you want to say, construct another column in your data set, which is going to be having all the times you have recorded, but shifted by say three hours. So that would be a way to do that, um, is to basically take the values you are having and to use in this case, hours function that basically adds this number of hours into your POSIX city uh, object. And you can see when you compare like this expression 
And this expression that this is like literally identical with the difference that our here is 22 versus here it was uh, 19. And lastly, uh, a function I personally use quite, quite a lot when it comes to uh, summarizing data, for example, within hours of the time, is the function that gives you floor date, or similarly, you can be interested in a sailing date. What it does, it is taking my POSIX city object and it is rounding that in case, in this case, rounding down to the closest full, in this case, hour. So the difference between my original one over here and this one I'm getting here is that the result is the like full hour that this observation is coming from. Um, there's a lot of variations of these functions. For example, you may want to replace one hour with three hours to have your data casted into like three hours interval information or um, to have here like um, 10 seconds, et cetera, et cetera. And similarly, you may be interested in exploring the sailing date, which does the same, except it is rounding up. And uh, again, a practical case of using such a function is for example, when I'm having inform information from individuals, which are of a high time resolution. So for example, imagine a situation where you are collecting like 10 or 20 observations per hour per individual. And um, the like one observation consists, for example, of a time and um, um, hmm, maybe like a temporal heart rate this person is uh, having. And you would like to be able to, for each hour, summarize what was the minimum and maximum of a heart rate for this person. A way to do that would be to, for example, use this floor date function that would um, organize the data you are having by assigning uh, one certain hour to each of these multiple observations that allows you to later aggregate the data. Maybe a little bit of evolved example. Um, Sorry, I'm scrolling not this way. Uh, last thing I wanted to cover with respect to different to uh, dates and date times are differences in dates. Um, a common example would be that you are getting a data frame where there are two columns, which both of them representing some um, either a year or or a time. So, for example, a date that somebody started work and finished work, and you would like to be able to compute the difference between the two columns. So for example, create yet a third column in a data that gives you the number of weeks between the two days, dates, or number of days between the two dates, or a number of years, etc. A function to do that is a div time, which takes, um, which takes uh, for example, three arguments. The first two arguments our values are, sorry, the first arguments are vectors of the type, uh, in this case, date. So I have created two um, vectors with the use of y and d function uh, to create a vectors of a class date. And I am um, using the div time function to compute the difference of them between them. And I am also saying that I want the difference to be expressed in a number of weeks. So the, the result of this function that would be printed would be actually this uh, character information, like the whole sentence would be printed from that. But you can further use as numeric function on that to get just a number that is expressing the weak differences between those two vectors. So again, a, a typical case of doing that would be when I want to uh, compute a difference either expressing days or years between the two dates I'm having in my data set, then I would basically use this expression to do that to my data set. And that concludes this part. We are having a lab when we are going to practice working with dates uh, on a real data. So I will stop sharing my screen. Um, the remaining part of what we have to be covered today is about two-dimensional uh, data classes. So two-dimensional data classes are those that we would typically use when we are reading in the data into the R. And precisely, one of the two-dimensional data classes are the ones that we've been covering uh, so far, which are the data frames. Uh, data frame is a general term to use. Uh, data frame is a general term which we use when we are uh, 
describing or referring to um, some variations of a data frames. It can be a object of a class data dot frame itself, but we have also seen a Tibo class that we've been working with. So more generally, we refer to them to the data class to the data frames. And they can be thought of as a traditional Excel-like spreadsheets. Um, what is specific about them is that they have different columns and different, uh, they have columns and rows and each entry is having a column and a row assigned. And I think the most specific thing to remember about the data frames is that the columns itself can be of a different classes. So for example, we can have one column which is describing an, uh, an age of a individual uh, in our data set, which would be of a class numeric, and we have another column which would be describing a date uh, related to something that would be of a date class. Another uh, two-dimensional data class that we want to discuss is a matrix. So matrix, similarly as a data frame, is composed of a rows and columns. It is like a rectangular form. But unlike a data frame, the entire matrix is composed of only one R class. So for example, you may have an entire matrix of a class numeric that's going to be only containing a numbers or an entire matrix of a class character. So the fact that one two-dimensional object, a data frame, can contain columns of a different classes versus the matrix cannot is the main thing that differentiates them. And I'm going to highlight some benefits why you may want to use a matrix in your analysis. Um, before we move on, uh, I want to touch back on a property of a one-dimensional uh, classes, a property of a vectors that I'm not sure if we uh, systematically discuss. So, uh, so far we've been, uh, for example, defining a vector just by using this uh, C function, opening the brackets and inserting the elements. Uh, here we are showing how to pull a subset of this vector. So say I am having an eight elements vector, which is consisting of characters, and I want to be able to pull one element of that. To do that, I am typing the name of the object I want to pull from, and I am opening this rectangular brackets. And inside of the brackets, I am defining the index of the element I want to pull. A very specific thing about R is that indexes are starting from one, not from zero, as you may encounter in other programming languages. So if I am interested in pulling element B, I'm going to specify index two because this is the because B is on the second uh, uh, location uh, in the vector X. Similarly, I may be interested in pulling a multiple elements at once. So let's say I want to pull element one and two, but let's say that for whatever reason I also typed the value one hundred here. And as you can tell, this vector is not having one hundred elements; it is having eight elements. So what I'm going to see as a return uh, are three elements vector where the first two elements are going to be the ones that have been pulled precisely because I specified the indexes one and two and the third value it is going to be this na not av not available slash not um uh not uh uh slash a missing value uh because this index does not exist and we are going to use this information to work with the uh matrices oh I think in this part I just want to draw your attention that in case you are having a very long vector being printed to your console, and in this case, I created a vector named x long, which consists of this part repeated 20 times, you can see that your console is going to be this uh, printing all the values by and also printing out those numbers over here. So those numbers over here are nothing else but just a number so, uh, telling you what is the index of the first observation on the left-hand side in this line. So A here is going to have index one, it is the first element, and C is going to index 19 as it is 19th element, etc. And very specifically, if you are having a short vector you're printing to the console, you're going to see this one being printed because this element is the first element of this vector. So just a technical note. And moving to the matrices, we want to briefly discuss. So uh, what I'm going to do here is to first create a vector of nine elements. And to do that, I'm using this semicolon shortcut that is generating me a sequence ranging from one to nine, separated by a value of one. 
and I'm going to use this vector to populate my matrix. So matrix, uh, this word matrix is a function itself. To use this function, I am opening the brackets and I am filling that in with the arguments. In this case, the only argument I necessarily need to supply are the, um, actually, um, I think you can actually uh, make a matrix which is empty. So I'm taking this necessarily supply back, but to create a matrix in this case, I am providing this vector n of those values, which are going to be uh, in my matrix. And I am also using the argument n row to specify uh, information about the shape of my matrix. So since I'm going to tell, make me a matrix which has three rows and I provided nine numbers, it is necessary that my matrix, it is going to be a three, uh, sorry, um, three rows by three columns matrix because there's like no other way to use nine numbers and has three rows. Uh, so I'm assigning the result of uh, this function to the uh, variable named mat and I'm printing mat to the console and you can see that uh, I ended up with a two dimensional three by three uh, matrix where the values one, two to nine are populated uh, column wise. By column wise, I mean that first column is having one, two, three, then we're having four, five, six, et cetera. Uh, and now we are coming back to subsetting uh, the data objects. We have seen that in case of the one dimensional vectors, we're basically providing indexes of the elements we want to pull. And the same stands for a two dimensional matrix. However, since the matrix is having two dimensions, we want to be able to pull or subset elements from both rows and columns as we are interested. So to do that, we are doing a similar thing, meaning we are typing the name of the element, uh, typing the name of the object, and we are opening this uh, square brackets as we did similarly as we did in case of a vector. Uh, however, this case, since matrix is two dimensional, to pull the elements, we're using this construct that there's a comma inside. And whatever indexes we are specifying on the left-hand side to the comma are going to be representing indexes of the rows we want to subset or retrieve from the matrix. And similarly, whatever is on the right-hand side from the comma is going to be representing the columns from the matrix. Uh, the first row is showing a particular case when I'm interested in pulling the element which is from row one and column one. So row one and column, column one, if I'm specifying that like that, it narrows down to taking only one entry from this nine element matrix which is being printed here. I may be interested in taking the whole first row from the matrix. To do that, meaning to not narrow down within the columns in any way, I am going to leave the space to the right from the comma blank. In that way, I am pulling everything which is in my three by three matrix, which is located within the first row. And very similarly, I can leave the uh, row index definition space blank, meaning there's nothing to the left-hand side of a comma, and just keep the one on the right-hand side saying I want to pull the first column of the matrix. And like with the vectors, I can use the vectors of the indexes themselves to specify a subset of the indexes I want to have. So in this case, I'm going to uh, pull two by two matrix because I am telling, give me the first two rows and second and a third column for my original matrix mat. So this is how the uh, matrices work. And before we move to the list, which is on the next slide, let me just comment that the reason you may want to work with matrices is because there are dedicated uh, functions that are going to allow you to do operations on, for example, only numbers very quickly. This includes things like um, inversing the matrices or um, creating summaries of the matrices. So for example, low, uh, um, computing a column means or column standard deviations or row means or row standard deviations very, very fast. Uh, if I am in need of such operations, I would first locate, I would first um, keep, I would first make a matrix which stores my data and then proceed with whatever I am interested in. So I would say that speed is one of the, um, uh, one of the benefits I may uh, take from the matrices that the data frames itself may not necessarily offer. Let me quickly check the chat. Um, yes, you can, okay, thank you for addressing that. So moving forward, we have a list. And um, 
lists are a list is one of the uh, most generic object in terms of what it can contains. So list itself can contains uh, can contain um, pretty much whatever you want to contain. It can be a vectors of uh, it can be a vectors of different uh, kind of a classes. It can be list containing other lists. Lists can be containing matrices. Um, pretty much a container that allow you to store different classes and different types of objects at once. And an example of that is provided here in the first line. So to create a list, I am using a function list. And you can see there is a name of the function. And there's a open brackets over here. And I am populating the list, meaning I am defining what elements are going to be in that. And in this case, there are three elements. The first element is a vector of a class character. The second element is a vector of class numeric. And the third element is a matrix. So then when I print my list uh, variable to the console, what I'm going to see is um, indexing of the elements. And elements of the list are going to be indexed by their number, which is going to be surrounded by this like double square brackets. And within this list, I am going to see the vector list that this is the vector that I put as a first element. Then I'm having the second element and I'm seeing the second vector. You may ask what this one is doing here. So um, a couple of slides ago, we covered that whenever I'm printing a vector to the console, it is going to show me the index of a first element. So this is precisely what this, why this one is showing here because it is telling us that what is the index of this first element in my tree length vector. And last but not least, I have the third element of my list, which I defined to be a matrix. And you can indeed see that we are having a two by two matrix provided here. And again, running the function class on this element is going to show me that this is a list. A specific thing about the list is that the elements of it can be named. To do that, I'm going to populate my list in a very similar manner as I have done a slide before. By, but instead of just providing its elements, I'm going also provide a number of, uh, sorry, a name of that. So a name, equal, equal sign, and the same element as previously. The difference is that now when I print my uh, list to the console, I'm going to see instead of this um, double brackets and a number, a name of the element. So the letters is what I assign to be a letters, etc. And um, when it comes to the data, the element selection from a list, you can do that in a couple of different ways. And uh, some ways are available once you provided a named list. So to access the first element of the list, either named or not named, I am going to use once again this funky double uh, square brackets and provide an index of element that I want to pull. So in this case, I'm providing one, and I'm seeing this three elements vector of characters that I have provided. In case my list was named, I can, instead of the number, provide the name, again, in the square brackets, or just use this dollar sign that you may recall we use a couple of times to provide, to pull the vector from the data frame uh, to to, for example, pull a certain column. So that would work as well. And I believe that was the last slide. Why we are uh, learning about the lists, you will see that uh, when we move tomorrow to um, uh, statistics, uh, one of the most common uh, situation you're going to encounter lists is when you are running, when you are fitting, for example, a regression model, the result of a regression model is going to be provide you uh, in the form of a uh, list itself. This list is going to be containing uh, a data frame or a matrix summarizing coefficients, but also like other elements which are going to be either like one vector or one character string uh, defining some specification of your model. So you're going to get in a return uh, a set of information which is going to be in the form of a list. So to access a particular element, you will see that we are going to be use one of this uh, approaches that we are having here. And the lab, which is to this section, is very straightforward. So I believe that for the sake of time, we are going to um, skip it. And I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and let the other instructor to take over.